laptop there. So you also said I don't want to see it. Okay. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mesdames et Messieurs, excusez-moi de vous interrompre, mais c'est maintenant le moment que notre cérémonie de présentation de recognition se début. Bon, um, we will now present two prestigious awards, the Cassie Alouette Award and the CSA John H. Chapman Award. And I'm going to see if this is going to work. Ha. Huh. All right. I'm <laughs> so that's very good. Um, right. Uh, the Alouette Award, which is the Cassie Award, we're going to proceed with that one first. Uh, thank you for the gracious agreement of the CSA for us to go first, and the CSA will, will come next. <laughs> the Alouette Award was introduced in 1995 to recognize an outstanding contribution to advancement in Canadian space technology, application, science, or engineering. It may be awarded to an individual, to a group, an organization or group of organizations as appropriate to the nature of the contribution. The contribution must be recognized as a Canadian-led space endeavor or as a significant Canadian contribution to an international program. Preference shall be given to contributions that lead to new benefits for mankind. Well, that's a pretty tall bill to fill. Um, so this year, um, I'm happy to announce that the 2018 honoree is the CANX-4 and CANX-5 Pre Precision Formation Flying Mission. Um, so the, uh, this is a team award, and the representative honorees and the citation are shown on the slides. Actually, the citation isn't, isn't shown. I'm going to tell you what that is, because it's kind of long, and I've abbreviated it. With us tonight are, at this table, uh, and they'll be joining us up here on the stage in just a moment from now, Dr. Cameron Ower from McDonald Detweiler and Associates, Dr. Jean-Claude Piedboeuf from the Canadian Space Agency, Mr. Doug Sinclair from Sinclair Interplanetary, uh, Lockie Scott, who is uh, representing Dr. Brad Wallace, who is the nominee from the Defence Research and Development Canada organization, Richard Worsfold, Ontario Centres of Excellence, and Dr. Robert E. Z, Space Flight Laboratory, University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. Uh, gentlemen, please come up and join President Jacques Giroux and I on stage so we may present you with your awards.
Okay, good evening. Thank you to Kazi for this honor. It's deeply appreciated. It's, um, it's humbling to have um, this award presented to us uh, tonight. Um, and I also want to thank our sponsors who are present here today, um, who share this award uh, with SFL. Uh, Canx4 and Canx5 uh, accomplished an international first in using nanosatellites, satellites seven kilograms apiece, to demonstrate um, sub-meter precise autonomous formation flying. And I guess the mission wasn't just a technical feat um, uh, because other people had accomplished formation flight before using much bigger, more expensive satellites. What made Canx 4 and 5 unique was the fact that it was done at extremely low cost compared to others. And that low cost has enabled follow-on missions like the one that we're working on now, the Hawkeye 360 Pathfinder mission, that's actually exploiting the technology for commercial use. And so Canx 4 and 5, its major accomplishment was in bringing down the bar, uh, the cost bar, associated with formation flight and enabling practical applications, enabling commercial exploitation, enabling uh, government departments, uh, countries that otherwise had small budgets to um, actually do interesting missions with formation flying in space. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I thought it would be important for me to give a little bit of context behind the Canx 4 and 5 formation flying mission. Um, when we first proposed Canx 4 and 5, it wasn't very popular to be developing nanosatellites. In fact, we had a lot of naysayers and a lot of people um, saying that we couldn't do it. So there were a lot of doubters. And, uh, you know, I say thank heaven for the doubters because they, they really inspired us to actually accomplish the mission. Um, but, you know, it was a daunting task. I won't, I won't say that it was easy. It was one of the most complicated missions that we've ever done and still remains to this day one of the most challenging missions we've ever done. And um, complicated choreography among attitude control, propulsion, formation control algorithms, navigation, all intertwined, you know, all having to be happy together to deliver this mission. But we were able to do it. It launched in 2014, and in five months' time, the mission was completed ahead of schedule. And we had demonstrated, I think, something like five different formations, uh, long track formations, projected circular orbit formations, ranging from 50 meters to 1,000 meters in distance. And so it was highly successful, and we completed the mission with about 75% of the fuel still remaining. So we kind of overplanned, um, which is the way we do missions. We like building robust satellites and robust missions. Um, so, you know, I just want to say that we've developed a number of nanosatellites over the years, including Canx 4 and 5, uh, the Bright Constellation. All these are relatively small spacecraft, about seven kilograms each. We've also developed microsatellites, um, but very often the accomplishments are, are underestimated by um, uh, people in Canada and by the international community. Uh, because of their small size, they think that, you know, these are so small they can't really do anything. The truth is that uh, it was very difficult, uh, it still is very difficult, to get these satellites to do important missions in space and do, to do high-performance missions. And so, in many ways, developing a, a tiny um, satellite that can do the job of a big satellite is much more difficult than developing a large satellite. Um, so. You know, we, we develop satellites ranging from three kilograms to 500 kilograms. We try to build the smallest satellites possible, as you can see from Canx 4 and 5. Um, but, you know, mass has never been a limit for us. I mean, I often get asked the question, so what's the biggest satellite that you've worked on? And, you know, I sort of raise my eyebrow when I get that question because inherent in that question is an attempt to place a limit on us. And uh, so I, I try to 
make it clear that seven kilograms is not a limit, 57 kilograms for most is not a limit, 70 kilograms for LEO2 is not a limit. Um, what really matters is understanding your environment, understanding how to do a good design, and delivering on that at, uh, at low cost, and size is not a limit if you go do those things. Um, so we help make business models work, we help governments achieve what they otherwise couldn't achieve within their budgets, and uh, we've been around for about 20 years now, and uh, I'd like to think that that's attributed to our great sponsors, um, but also because of the hardworking people at, at the Space Flight Lab. So over 84 years of cumulative on-orbit heritage and across 22 satellites, and um, at first we felt like the, the black sheep of the family, but now we feel like the black swan, I guess. Um, <laughs> I want to thank some great people and great organizations that were instrumental in um, making Canex 4 and 5 possible. Uh, Major Frank Pinckney, who was the leader of the Space Systems Group at, uh, at DRDC Ottawa at the time, was really the champion of the mission. He was courageous enough to um, uh, initially fund the mission when uh, no one else would, and, uh, and he really uh, helped us get started. Gilles Leclerc from uh, Space Agency, the uh, DG of Space Technology at CSA at the time, was also another instrumental player in making the mission happen. And Professor Chris DeMarin, uh, who should be here in the audience today, um, he's currently Professor and uh, Director at Utias. He helped with the formation control algorithms, one of the smartest people I've ever met, by the way. Um, Professor Susan Scone and Elizabeth Cannon at the University of Calgary also helped with the navigation algorithms. Last but not least, the staff and students of uh, the Space Flight Laboratory. It's really an honor for me to be working with such a crew um, each and every day, and, and I think it's safe for me to say without being too self-congratulatory that um, they're among the best in the world when it comes to small satellites. So to finish off, I, I just wanna say thank you, and I, I wanna uh, emphasize that we've been able to achieve different results, being a different kind of animal, um, and, uh, and we invite others to collaborate with us in the future. Um, we we want to make your missions happen. We want to be able to do more for Canada. I know that there's a lot more that we can be doing for Canada. And so I look forward to that future, and I thank you for the award. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jacques. Um, it's now my great pleasure to turn the procedure, <coughs> the proceedings, rather, <laughs> this evening. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's not a procedure. So this isn't going to hurt anybody. <laughs> I'd l <laughs> turn this over to uh, Monsieur Sylvain Laporte, to the president of the Canadian Space Agency, to make the presentation of the John H. Chapman Award of Excellence. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure tonight to, uh, to uh, make a, uh, an announcement for a, uh, a very illustrious award. Um, but before I, I do start that, congratulations again to the Alouette team. What a fantastic uh, challenge that you guys were able to overcome, and you certainly showed a lot of determination and grit in making, uh, in making all of that happen. So well done, and, and the prize certainly, and the award is certainly well, well deserved for sure. I um, also want to thank uh, Jeff and, uh, and Jacques uh, for the opportunity for, for us to, uh, to give this award out um, tonight. Uh, we don't give the award out every single year. Um, we do it um, when it's felt that it's required to be, uh, done, to be done, when we have eligible people that are uh, meritorious and, uh, and uh, need, to be, uh, need to be recognized, which is the case tonight for sure. So, um, you know, the John H. H. Chapman, or it's actually Herbert, right? So I discovered that just lately. So the John Herbert Chapman Award of Excellence was started in the year 2000, and it's only been given 12 times so far. Um, tonight will be the 13th time that the award is actually uh, provided to an individual. And uh, it's meant to um, 
to, uh, um, it's a prestigious award, sorry, uh, created to recognize an individual or a group of outstanding achievements in space science and technology. Comme nous le savons tous, John H. Chapman est le père fondateur du programme spatial canadien. Dans les faits, il est l'esprit qui soutient l'Agence spatiale canadienne, un rêve qu'il a caressé pendant plus de 30 ans avant qu'il ne se matérialise en 1989, dix ans après son décès, malheureusement. John Chapman was a visionary, several steps ahead of his time. A pioneer, he laid the foundation of the Canadian space program and then spurred its growth because he believed that we had the talent, the ingenuity, and the daring to be the best at what we choose to be. So tonight, we give the award named in Chapman's honor to a man who has devoted his entire career of over four decades to building the Canadian space program that Chapman envisioned. The, the recipient for this year's award is Dr. Virendra Jha. Congratulations, Dr. Jha. Dr. Jha began his, uh, his space career in 1972 when he joined the aerospace group of RCA Limited Montreal. Now, there's only probably a few of us in the room with enough gray hair to remember RCA, right? So it takes us back a, a long ways back, um, which later became Spar Aerospace Limited, where he became Director of Engineering in 1988. He distinguished himself by developing technical innovations that led to reductions in both size and cost of Canadian satellites and other space hardware while enhancing their performance. Um, I did not have the pleasure to work with you, Dr. Jha, but I understand that you were not above getting your, your hands dirty and getting involved into the details of a project. And in fact, I, someone shared a story with me, and I hope, I hope I get this right. But with respect to getting your hands dirty, I understand that you know, in an early part of your career when you were a very junior engineer, um, you developed some kind of filter that you needed to take to Ottawa to get it space certified, probably at, at DFL. And uh, you drove back to Montreal. It was probably fairly late. And I understand the story goes a bit like your, your desk was a, a clutter of, of all sorts of papers and whatnot. And you actually put the filter on top of the garbage can and you left for home. Um, so you can see how this is going to develop, right? So <laughs> he comes back, he comes back the next morning, right? And oh my God, the filter is not there. And, and you probably had one of those anxiety attacks because that was probably grounds for firing or something like that. And you were able to, to coach or coax a, uh, a colleague of yours to, uh, to help you go through the garbage cans of this large corporation, right? So we're not, you can imagine, we're not talking about one single garbage can. This is a, a large outfit. So there were multiple garbage cans out there and you basically had to find a filter. Mm. All of them. So um, I can now imagine you, you know, waist deep into garbage trying to find this filter without making too much noise so that you would attract attention and people would discover the, the mistake. I understand that you eventually found it, and uh, the professional that you are, you made sure that it was fully tested and it was still uh, operating quite uh, quite the way it should be. Uh, it should be operating. So you kind of lucked in that way, and I guess you were not fired. Um, but it, <laughs> it it certainly shows that you know when we talk about the 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 uh, the uh, expression of getting your hands dirty, you you took it literally for <laughs> sure. You know, and 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 not only that, it, you know, we're, you were probably one of the first. Uh, one of the first in, uh, in uh, the space sector at the time to, to have conducted the, worst, the, the world's first uh, space debris mission as well. <laughs> so um, Dr. Jha then uh, joined the CSA in 1991 where he held various executive management positions including DG of Space Technologies. Um, seems like there's been a number of you in that position already, right? So, um, and now we have a next CFO in that job so that's gonna be quite, quite interesting. Um, Vice President of Science, uh, Technology and Programs and Acting President. He then came back to his technical roots as the agency's Chief Engineering Advisor until he retired in 2014. Well, he retired from the CSA. I know that you've been quite busy still with a number of other activities. 
Um, his work in the CSA senior management led him to be part of almost every project and mission Canada has put into space from the Canada Arm to Hermes, ANIC, and other SATCOM missions, Cassiope, RadarSat 1 and 2, as well as the upcoming Constellation mission. His technical and leadership contributions have been well recognized both nationally and internationally. Over the course of his remarkable career, Dr. Ja has been best bestowed, oh, my, for a Frenchman, sorry, that's really hard to say, has been bestowed with numerous awards and honors. He is a recipient of the Alan D. Emil Memorial Award given by the International Astronomical Federation, the Queen's Jubilee Medal, and Cassie's own Alouette Award back in 1999, just to name a few. I can't help but think that this John H. Chapman Award will occupy a special place in that prestigious list. Would you please join me in a round of applause for the winner of the 2018 John Herbert Chapman Award of Excellence, Dr. Viran Raja. Thank you, Sylvain. <clears throat> uh, actually, before I start my speech, I want to make a comment about Robert Z. I was the one who started the small satellite program at CSA, so I know the difficulty of putting large things into small things. And it reminds me of a quotation which Bernard Shaw had. He was writing a letter and he said, I apologize for writing this long letter because I did not have time to write the short one. Anyway, uh, 50 years ago, while I was growing up in India, if somebody had said to me that someday you will be standing in Canada and will be recognized for an award for contribution to the Canadian space program, it would not only be improbable, it will be considered a mathematical impossibility. What made this mathematical impossibility, it, what it turned into reality is confluence of several factors which fortunately all came together in my life. And these factors start from, starting from India, a belief, a very strong belief that if you are an engineering graduate and if you had a master's or a PhD degree from North America, anywhere in North America. At that time, we did not understand the difference between Canada and USA. It's all the same thing. <laughs> so, and if one did a degree from North America, then going back to India, the prospects were much brighter. So that belief is the first reason which prompted me to leave India and come to McMaster University for his studies. The second reason, which again totally happened by chance, while I was doing my PhD, a professor from McMaster University got a contract from RCA to write a software for filter. And I was getting $200 per month, barely surviving. This professor came and offered me $600 a month. So I put my PhD on the side and I wrote this software, I spent six months and those were the days where people did not understand computers, did not understand software. And I was looking, probably my future will be more into the IT side at that time. But I wrote this software and I came to RCA with the professor to explain to them how to use the software. The manager of the group, those who know, or God help his soul, Val O'Donovan, 
He's the founder of Comdare, which is now Honeywell. So he was the manager. He looked at me with his strange eyes as if I was explaining something out of this world. <laughs> and he says, ah, this is too complex. What are you doing? I said, I'm doing my PhD. He said, leave the PhD, come and join us. <laughs> I listened to him <laughs> because he was offering me $12,000 a year. <laughs> Anyway, I came to Montreal, and that, that's how I got into the space industry. And fortunately, later on, Concordia allowed me to submit my thesis, so I finished my PhD there. And I've been very lucky because I had very good mentors. So I'll tell you a few stories, but those stories are what taught me. Val O'Donovan, when I joined this uh, RCA Limited, First thing he said is, they were building CTS, which is the Army satellite at that time. He says, you are new, you don't know much about engineering. Here are all the drawings he gave me, I don't know, 30, 40 drawings of transponder, which is the communications payload of the CTS satellite. He says, go and tell me how much it should weigh because I have to get the budget. I spent nearly two months. After a lot of hard work, I went to him, I said, 67 pounds. Those were still the days of pounds. He says, that's very good. I'm going to ask for 108 pounds of budget. <laughs> I said, well, what's the relationship? I spent so much time, and there's no connection between the two numbers. He says, first lesson for you in space, in program management. He says, three things will always go up, cost, power, and mass. And if you get the right budget in the beginning, your life will be a lot easier. <laughs> he says 108 pounds is far removed from 67. We'll never reach there. It looks like it has been calculated. <laughs> 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 and your life will be at ease. And he was right. So this was the <laughs> first lesson I got. And uh, the second mentor who I had was, again, those of you who may know him, was Joe McNally. I had the, he was at the CSA later on in his career, like I was. But in the beginning, I worked with him on G Star and Brazil Set and you know, one other satellite. And he told me a story how to make a compromise between engineering and politics. He told me about, he was the manager for ISIS. He said, when ISIS satellite was totally ready, you know, as it happens, ministers come and visit. So Minister Sowe, at that time, she was coming to visit. And then someone noticed that the plate on the ISIS satellite is only in English. They said, well, this is a French-Canadian minister. We must have plate in both languages. And ISIS was a spinner axis, so which means it's very well balanced. Anyway, the. For political reasons, the plate in French was mounted on the other side of the satellite. Joe told me, he says, I could not say a word because this is a political issue. He says, I could not sleep in the night. At 2.30 in the night, he got up. He took the screwdriver from his garage, went and removed the French plate, and that's how the sh satellite was shipped. And everyone knows it worked for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how he taught me that you have to balance the third manager who taught me the value of time and money in a space program, his name was Gil Branchflower. I was at SPAR. I was manager of mechanical engineering at that time. SPAR had a contract to build 50 channel amplifiers for Intelsat 6 satellites. We built this, uh, these amplifiers, and they were all tested we, it was Hughes Aircraft, which is now called Boeing. They said, we don't need the uh, amplifiers now. You keep them in your storage. And in two months, you send it back to us. Two months later, when these uh, amplifiers were retested, opened, there were fine cracks, which appeared just sitting on the shelf with no reason. Now, the general manager, Gil Branchflower, he called me in his office. Because it's a mechanical issue, it's a crack. He says, uh, well, we have a serious problem. We have a $30 million problem. And uh, <clears throat> you have to 
in the first week, tell me what the reason is. In the second week, you have to tell me what the solution is. In the third week, you have to convince Hughes Aircraft that the solution you are proposing is acceptable and we can ship the units. And then he says, and in three weeks, if you cannot do this, then your successor will do it in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I fortunately succeeded in doing it. Uh, and, uh, but again, it taught me the value of money and time in space programs. The, when I joined the space agency, then obviously, again, I had very good mentors. Uh, we had uh, Jack Chambers, we had uh, Mac Evans, both of whom taught me, because when you come from industry, generally you are impatient. So they taught me that patience is one of the biggest virtues in the government. <laughs> and especially Mac, he taught me that sometimes if you don't make any decision, then the problems disappear. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the reason I'm standing here today is mostly because of the good mentors I had. I was also very fortunate to have the, the employees who worked for me and the colleagues with whom I worked. I, I've been very lucky. Uh, <clears throat> at the CSA, we have achieved a lot of success in the past with a budget averaging $30 million, $300 million a year in comparison to 18 billion of NASA, 4 billion of Europe, 3 billion of Jap uh, Japan. I think we have garnered a lot of international respect. We have done so by choosing selectively and building key components for important missions. In order to keep industry humming and Canada keeping its reputation amongst the spacefaring nations, it is essential that we keep building hardware hardware which no other country can build or has built. Unfortunately, CSA budgets have been shrinking and do not permit many of these manufacturing activities to continue. I hope the grand vision of Canadian space program will re-emerge soon. My vision of the future for Canada's space program is that Canada would take the lead in building the first V-band payload. We'll take the lead in building the first software-based radio communication satellite. We'll be the first one to place in orbit vehicles which will be servicing other satellites and roaming in space. And it will be the, as again, the country which will take lead we missed the opportunity. At one point, we could have been the first one to build the hyperspectral satellite. But my hope is that the vision, this grand vision, and the vision of the Canadian government someday will line up. And I hope and wish for the president of the agency, who has been trying very hard, that uh, someday the success in increasing the budget will be there. I've been blessed to have the opportunity to work in Canadian space program. I have witnessed tremendous technological progress from the time when satellite receivers used to be 12 inches by 12 inches by 6 inches to now when a receiver can be built on a chip and has to be seen through microscope. I've also seen time when uh, we had to write uh, long handwritten memos to now when there is instant communication. Also the time when the word used to be analog to now, which is dig digital. And uh, having been witness to all this, I feel that uh, I have been very blessed uh, to be here in Canada. I'd like to thank the Canadian Space Agency for honoring me with this prestigious award. I cherish the memories I have of my time at CSA. When I go to CSA, I feel like I'm walking in an extended family environment. And lastly, but uh, not least, I'd like to thank Ranjana, my wife of 43 years, who has not only supported me in reaching greater heights in space, but has equally been responsible in, in raising our two children, Munish and Shalini, which I consider even bigger achievement than this.
Thank you very much. Well, um, this was a great honor for us all, I think, to celebrate with Virendra and Mrs. Zhao um, this, this award uh, of great distinction. My, I've uh, had the honor of personally knowing Virendra for some years, and uh, I have to share everybody's view that it, it really, I, I believe he's mentored me, so thank you for that. Um, so in closing, um, I'd like to say that we greatly appreciate the opportunity to partner with the Canadian Space Agency on this evening of camaraderie, conversation, and celebration of achievement. I hope you have all enjoyed the evening, and please linger as long as you would like. If you have, had, if you have asked us to keep any personal items in the administration room down the hall, uh, please uh, come with me uh, shortly, and we'll go and fetch them for you. Uh, I hope everyone has a restful night, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>